Hi, everybody. Happy Wednesday and welcome to our webinar. I'm Caroline here from Sellers Funding, and I have an amazing group of panelists here. Before they introduce themselves, while everyone is still joining, the question on everyone's mind, who are we rooting for in the World Cup? Alex, you are upper left on my screen. Who are you rooting for? Uh, I got to go for Morocco, the, Morocco. the underdog. Yeah. I know there's a game happening right now, so I apologize. I fully appreciate and support anyone having dual screens on so you can keep up with the game. <laughs> what about you, Ryan? Yeah, I would say uh, I think the what Cinderella story, but not really for the best player in the world, is for Argentina and Lionel Messi. So uh, he's never won before, so it's kind of a underdog, but you want him to win because he's one of the best in the world. So kind of like mm -hmm. when LeBron James never won, but you want him to win. It's kind of a fulfilling story, so I'm rooting for them. Good reason, Brandon. I'm going to go with whoever has the best food. Uh, I love steak and Argentinians are really good at, uh, you know, churrascarias and stuff. So I'm going to go with Argentina. It's good. Tyler, you're up. Yeah, I'm leaning Argentina. Just love the story of Messi and whatnot. And, you know, when you see a, a legend playing and finishing his career on that kind of note, it's pretty, pretty cool to watch. I know he's been around a long time. I know he's probably the favorite at this point, but, you know, it's always fun to see kind of legends cement themselves. Yeah, we Sellers Funding actually posted a LinkedIn poll to see who people were rooting for. We did it yesterday morning, obviously before the semifinals. And right now it feels like Argentina, everyone is rooting for Argentina. So we will see how it plays out. Final is on Sunday and the game happening right now, France, Morocco. Stay tuned. Now, what is everyone's favorite holiday tradition? Obviously, we're in Q4 and we're all swamped at work. But your favorite holiday tradition, we'll start with you this time, Tyler. Uh, it's simple, <laughs> but just family time. Uh, I've been in e-commerce for like seven years now. And the holiday season for e-commerce world, as everyone probably knows here, is a very, very busy time. It's just having a dedicated you know, Christmas day or day, whatever celebration that you choose um, or that you celebrate. Just having that set aside to you know get offline, not work, not have other obligations, and just be able to see close friends, close family, whoever it is, but just having that dedicated day for me is always nice in this time of year. That's great. What about you, Brandon? So I, I think Q4 is quite a grind. What I, what I really enjoy is seeing like the, the fruits of the entire year paying off because we start planning Q4 in Q1, basically, mm -hmm. uh, product development, supply chain, understanding, you know, what we're going to need to do to execute on those goals. So um, it's a really fulfilling time if, if everything uh, is executed well. Um, and so I, I, I just love that part of it. It's, uh, it's, it's, it, it keeps you hungry and wanting to do it again. That's great, Ryan. Yeah, I mean, I think like a lot of the people here, you kind of, you're expecting a lot of things to either dip or a lot of bad things to happen. So it's very stressful for a lot of sellers, customers, whoever you're working for or with or for yourself. So it's kind of a, a nice sigh of relief. But I think tradition wise, uh, personally, I, I think it's nice to to kind of reflect on the the good that happened this past year. Obviously the the wins, you can take the wins when a lot of people are talking about forecasting, which we'll be talking about the today of like, oh, what will happen this year? Like mm -hmm. we overcame all those boundaries, but personally, I would say, um, just eating a ton of food, no matter what form it comes in. And then, um, you know, just spending time with, uh, my son, um, and my wife and obviously opening a bunch of either presents or, you know, sharing thoughtful things about each other. So that's always a nice time of year and then traveling to see family as well. Good, Alex. Uh, yeah, for me, it's a lot of family time. So Christmas Eve is big. Christmas is big. Um, and then maybe something um, a little bit more unique, uh, at least versus everyone else here on the panel, is that uh, in Canada, uh, Boxing Day is the day mm -hmm. after Christmas, right? So Boxing Day is usually pretty exciting. Uh, I enjoy just like going out with friends and seeing, you know, uh, what deals there are and stuff like that. That's great. I don't, it's 
it's so awful of me to not consider Boxing Day and that kind of stuff. But yes, the holiday season extends beyond Christmas, of course. Um, so for me, I one of my favorite things is I do all the holiday baking for my family. And so I usually will take a day off of work. I put on Harry Potter, start to finish. I'll just rotate through the movies and I bake all day. And it is, it's one of my favorite days. Um, it's, yeah, I just love it. <laughs> Um, so while we are getting started, I'm going to let our panelists introduce themselves in just a moment. But while you guys are here, please leave your questions for our panelists either in the chat or in the Q&A. We'll address some Q&A throughout. That's going to be a very casual discussion type of event as we're all planning for 2023. Um, so keep the questions coming. We will keep bringing them up. So I will let everyone introduce themselves again. I'm Caroline from Seller Spending. We are an all-in-one financial suite designed specifically for e-commerce brands and sellers. And we can help with everything from working capital to daily advance so that you can get your marketplace payouts even sooner. So Alex joins us. Would you mind introducing yourself? For sure. Um, I'm a creator operations strategist at Perpetua. So Perpetua is a um, e-commerce and marketing optimization tool. And the area that I focus on is actually um, influencer marketing. So basically creating a solution for brands to easily access and scale their influencer marketing strategy. That's great. Influencer marketing is definitely going to be big. Tyler. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Caroline. Uh, my name is Tyler Gregg, VP of Strategic Initiatives at Amped. Uh, Amped is an ads platform where we help Amazon brands leverage Google ads and sending Google ads traffic to Amazon uh, with full attribution. So similar to the influencer side of things, but on the Google side. So the external traffic and helping Amazon brands become, you know, maybe not less reliant on Amazon ads, but diversifying their marketing stack and being an omni-channel uh, brand selling on Amazon. Awesome. Ryan, would you mind telling us about Frisbee? Yeah. Uh, so my name is Ryan Kramer. I've been in e-commerce for seven years. Uh, my background is in e-commerce bingo. Um, it's anywhere from direct to seller, uh, direct to seller brands, uh, for home gift garden decor, um, zero to seven figures in my first two years of figuring out e-commerce. Um, I've worked for software companies anywhere from a uh, viral launch to ping pong payments and international, you know, uh, finance and now working with Frisbee. Um, figuring out helping brands to get to that next level, right? Thinking bigger, how to get them to different marketplaces around the world uh, via FBA. So um, that's what we do here at Frisbee through technology and uh, through services. And last but not least, Brandon, it feels like you're everywhere. So tell us more. Yeah, so we're we're sellers first. Uh, my wife and I started selling in 2015. We started our own brands in 2016. Uh, this year, we did over 20 million in sales on Amazon. That um, the learnings from selling are what allow us to teach it. So we have Seller Systems, which is a full college level course, mastermind with a la carte master classes and stuff. And then those same methodologies that we teach and that our team uses, we've automated with our own software, which is Data Dive. So it's like a three-legged table that all supports each other, kind of, is, is, is the way I look at it. That's great, though, having the perspective as a seller as you're building things. That is where you're most successful because you're hands-on and you know what people need. Yeah, I think that that's a huge uh, part of... Um, understanding how to go deeper into topics, because it's one thing to know that sellers need a tool, but mm -hmm. then understanding how to go deeper and help them execute it and make it more efficient and streamline it is, is, is only done really with practice, I think. Yeah, that's great. So we're gonna jump into our first question. Now that we're at the end of the year, what has surprised you most about 2022, whether it was the flop of a software or something on the rise? What has surprised you in the space of e-commerce, Amazon, all of that? Tyler? Oh, man. Uh, leading, leading off on this one, I, I don't want to get booed off the stage this early, but I am, one, one thing that surprised me was the supply chain uh, and how Amazon brands tackled it. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a 
big issue. We definitely don't want to play that down by any means. But um, I was surprised by how consistently, you know, I'd get on calls with brands and I would say like, hey, like, how are you handling the supply chain? And a lot of them were like, hey, you know, it's a challenge, but here's the plan. Here's how we're tackling. Here's how we're getting around it. Here's how we're getting through it. And it was really cool uh, to see that, you know, our background at AMP comes from more uh, enterprise D2C type. And we kind of made the pivot over into servicing Amazon brands about a year ago. And it was so cool to see the entrepreneurial spirit shine through on tackling these challenges and the trials and tribulations. So it was, I guess, maybe surprised, but not surprised now that I know the ecosystem a lot better. But it was just so cool to see that those setbacks, those challenges were just tackled head on. And a lot of brands were able to, you know, make it through pretty successfully. And it was challenging for sure. But it was just so cool to see folks get through it and not just let it weigh them down or make excuses and say, oh, we'll get them next year once this settles down. Like people are still launching products, sourcing new ideas and, and going to market with a lot of new uh, ideas and products. Yeah, I want to add something to what he said, um, but but not just that. I think that he's 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 purposely being a little humble. One of the most surprising things for me happened on a webinar with Amped and Amazon. <laughs> And I thought you were going to say this, but I think you did it because you didn't want to be plugging. <laughs> Amazon admitted that they were okay with outside traffic impacting ranks positively. Not only that, they actually wrote it into their own slides in a presentation that they did with Amped. And that was one of the most surprising things because they've always been against rank manipulation. They've always like they've been dropping the hammer on a lot of different strategies sellers would use for ranking. But then for them to come out, talk about Google ads impacting rank positively uh, in, a, in a webinar uh, was kind of surprising because the way it's written in the terms of service with Amazon, even PPC on Amazon, especially sponsored products, they do impact ranks and that could be considered rank manipulation too. So they kind of cleared that up by saying, okay, paid ads are okay to impact ranks, not just on Amazon, but also off Amazon with Google. That was one of the most surprising things for me. Uh, and it happened with uh, with Tyler. So it was very surprising. I appreciate that, Brandon. I'm saving all my plugs for later in the thing. <laughs> so I appreciate you getting the plug early for me there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, just piggybacking onto that, it, it was cool to see. For me, it actually wasn't, it, the surprising that Amazon actually acknowledged it. Um, we'd seen it happening. So we, we weren't surprised that it was happening or that it, external traffic of all sorts, not just Google ads, like influencers, TikTok, all sorts of external. Amazon is seemed to be waiting pretty heavily. But yeah, it was, I, I was on that webinar and I was trying to keep a pretty, uh, pretty straight face when Amazon actually started showing case studies and stuff that made it through their legal department, which I know is no small feat. For all that's we good. know, someone lost their job for that, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's hope not. Let's hope not. <laughs> What about you, Ryan? What surprised you this year? Yeah, uh, for those of us who have been doing this for a decent amount of time, I would hate to say that anything shocked me, but it's I think it's the fact that we thought things would, quote, go back to normal um, or there'd be some sort of normalcy. I think there's always going to be some sort of hiccup, roadblock, uh, barrier to overcome, whatever term you want to use. Um I mean, to hate to hate to uh, to piggyback off logistics, it's always going to be the main cog that if everything's going smoothly, no one talks about it. But when it throws a wrench into it, everyone wants to complain about it. Um, for us over at Frisbee, we saw lots of people who who just couldn't get any sort of um, times to get in inventory into Amazon FBA warehouses um, for weeks, if not months, uh, leading up to Q4 um, during the busiest time of year. There was a promise of four months of inventory for lots of different, for all sellers uh, by Amazon directly, which impacted a lot of big sellers. I know Brandon and I've talked to you about this before. Uh, people have seen their, you know, uh, inventory limits go up and down and no one can uh, make heads or tails about it. And even asking Amazon global sales teams directly, uh, we have weekly calls with all those teams no one can answer our questions about that. So it's very frustrating internally, but also externally for sellers who are just trying to plan and forecast and, and kind of develop their own model. Um, thought they can grow. And that's a really frustrating thing for lots of sellers. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of the most surprising, but not surprising 
thing that we've seen. Uh, I, I think that you're kind of seeing these lots of sprinklings happen of where Amazon's going to go into the future. Not surprising, but somewhat leaning into social commerce. Um, you're seeing the the new, you know, Amazon Inspire, I believe is the official title of it, what it's called, a, a scrolling functionality to, again, based on external traffic, Amazon wants to create that 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 platform, if you will, of where people can go and find new, you know, products to engage with, influencer, influencers to engage with. It all comes back to this content marketing um, ecosystem that they're trying to build out, which is, is something that I'm, I'm assuming we're going to be talking about more here later in the webinar. So that, that would be my big takeaways. I mean, bringing in influencers, it's like he handed you your little bit, Alex. <laughs> I've done this before, guys. Come on. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, yeah, for me, honestly, um, there were quite a few surprises. Um, I think uh, after the like highs of 2021, it felt like everything was up exclusively. Um, and then coming into 2022, um, I was pretty surprised to see some of like the titans in the industry fall a bit. Um, like Facebook got smacked. Um, Google showed a lot of weakness. I'm speaking specifically from the ad side of things because that's the perspective that I come with. Um, for me, um, the surprise was kind of twofold. One was how strong Amazon's ad business remained. So like going, going into Q3 earnings, I was really expecting to see Amazon take a bigger hit, but they actually accelerated in Q3, um, which was really surprising. Um, and as well, like all of this talk about um, recession, like cutting budgets, seeing Google and Facebook get hit pretty hard. Um, I was expecting to see influencers also get hit pretty hard because um, the theory, at least that we were discussing, was just that you know people want something that is super attributable, super bottom of funnel, um, and historically influencers is not as bottom of funnel or as attributable as Amazon ads, for example. Um, but we're seeing like tons and tons of demand for influencer marketing, um, and that's maintained all the way through Q4. So that's been a big surprise. Yeah, I can tell you as a seller that uh, there was no surprise that Amazon's earnings on ads were were higher. In <laughs> <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> there was all of our tacos were up significantly this year, so um, definitely hitting us over the head for more ad placement. I, I don't want to rabbit trail us, but I'm curious, Brandon, is there a breakpoint on you know those CPCs and you know? There's got to be at some point. Is that approaching us? Do you think, or is it still room? Yeah. So what I'm thinking is that the market is going to weed itself out to where the more sophisticated and better sellers that are that are good at SEO and organic rank are going to continue to win because we can afford to continue to spend more and pull the right levers. Um, and it impacts us uh, and less than someone who's relying on ad traffic uh, for the majority of their sales. So I think our strategies are just... Uh, are suited for a more competitive marketplace. But yeah, I think a lot of sellers are gonna give up on, on niches that they could be profitable if they had just launched it properly um, and things like that. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it probably makes sense, right? I mean, eventually, I mean, the marketplace getting more and more competitive and you know, obviously yeah. you think five years ago, you guys know more than I do being kind of the new guy in the industry, but it, it was probably a lot easier to sell and launch five years ago than it is now. And, you know, the, you gotta be more sophisticated. You gotta have long-term strategies to really kind of continue and, and keep rising to the top. That is all so, that is so very true. And I mean, between everything that you're talking about, we talked about influencers, we're talking about off of Amazon ads, we're talking about logistics, all of these different pieces of every Amazon e-commerce seller's business. So is there anything, any like one item that you would recommend 
a seller e-commerce brand implement in 2023 if they haven't done it already? What's like top of your list of must have, must do things? Alex, we'll start with you. All right. Uh, yeah, for me, uh, maybe obviously uh, it's a TikTok strategy. Um, so TikTok is obviously huge. Uh, it's grown massively since the pandemic. Um, maybe like, so for me, it's obvious that you should, so, you know, be on TikTok to reach that audience. Um, but maybe not so obvious was um, that in like the summer, they released a new ad unit called Spark Ads. Um, and we've just seen like incredible success through Spark Ads specifically. Um, so in terms to, to be more specific, not just a TikTok strategy, but I think a TikTok Spark ad strategy is one that I would implement. And what makes a Spark ad so special, yes. different? I was gonna ask the same thing. I'm like, what's the yeah. difference? <laughs> okay, so, um, so a Spark ad is basically uh, the equivalent of boosting or like a branded content post on Instagram. So it's taking a piece of content that's already been live and then promoting it to an audience of your choice. So you can filter who you're targeting. Um, and then when the ad shows to that viewer, it looks like it's coming from uh, the creator. So it looks more organic and is therefore more compelling. And it also has a like direct shop now button. So it really shortens the flow to purchase versus like seeing a video, clicking the account, going to the link tree in the bio, finding the link, and then all that, this like brings you right to the page. So it's just a really, really strong unit. So uh, let me let me get this right. If someone, if someone has, like as a TikTok influencer or just for fun makes a video playing a game or a toy, like of, of their kid playing with a toy that's similar to one I make, not mm -hmm. the same one. I can boost that and link to my toy. Uh, it's not as easy as that. <laughs> that would be cool, um, but probably create a lot of problems. Um, you would need to reach out to that creator. So like slide into their DMs and basically ask for a code, a Spark Ads authorization code. Okay, Once so they you need give to get you that the, code. So you need the authorization of the creator. You can't just boost a random video. Correct. That makes yes, more sense. But it, okay. but it is actually like way easier than a branded content post on Instagram. All you need is that that code. And as long as you have that code, cool. you can pay for ads from, from any ads manager account. I'm making notes. So I'm going to go do this. <laughs> I know Brandon is newer on TikTok, so he's super excited about this. And I am also newer on TikTok. We are considering it as a social strategy just on our end. Um, and so I was testing it out personally. So these kinds of little golden nuggets are why people show up for webinars. So thank you so much, Alex. Ryan, nice. what should people do? Have ad. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it seems so obvious, but it, it's kind of apparent from a lot of the big brands that have fallen this year. So I'm taking it from a, from a negative perspective. If you don't have control on your inventory, um, you know, system, I would say, um, whether that be the flow of, of, of money, I'll say, I'll say that it's kind of, uh, coming from a seller's funding perspective, we don't have your flow of your funds, right. Um, you look at one of the top sellers in the United States, if not the world pharma packs, uh, I saw a picture yesterday posted on LinkedIn of just this barren warehouse, no longer, there's no employees, there's no more, um, there's no more inventory. There's there's no more brands, and they were one of the top sellers on Amazon. And the model's different, right? They're they're a reseller for the most part, but they were just turning over so much. They were doing so much in sales in one day, but they had to be solely dependent on their their inventory and their supply chain, which they didn't have control over entirely. So if you I'll, don't, I'll have say an, one thing about yeah, that really go quickly, ahead. Ryan. I think I think people should know. Their strategy was to lose a little bit of money per product to try to yes. chase away competition and then try to make it up in volume. Right. So that, that math doesn't math. 
Like if, you, if you're exactly. losing, exactly. If you're losing 25 cents a unit and then you sell a million units, you lost a lot more than a quarter. You didn't, you didn't suddenly make money, but anyway, go ahead. Which, which is part of the bigger, the bigger problem, right? That's uh, part of the bigger problem. What happened to them? <laughs> small math. Yeah. Small math doesn't equal uh large math differentiating <laughs> equations. Right. So, um, First and foremost, I always tell people, if your math doesn't work out from the beginning with one unit, it won't work out in a thousand or 10,000. So that's always, that's always good to remind people of that. But unfortunately people go out of business as, as example. Um, but it, having inventory issues and, and just having a lock on that, um, we've seen if you're, if you're a brand that's consolidating, condensing, for example, I'll, I'll even throw the influ uh, the aggregator model in of trying to take 17 different brands and mesh them all into one, you know, logistic system and try to have one person oversee that or a team oversee all these different brands. They're coming from different places. They need to be assembled differently. Um, they're not experts in that field. It, it's a, it's a strain on the ecosystem and it, and it, and it can affect you overall. It can affect your employee uh, retention numbers. It can affect your profitability. It can affect all these things. So if you don't have control over certain parts of the ecosystem, whether it be sourcing from a, a factory and that factory, you know, for example, gets shut down due to COVID restrictions in, in China, or um, it has to, it gets, you know, a boat, boat gets stuck at port, something along those lines. You you simply don't have control of that. It, it strains on your business and you don't have control over it. Number one thing that you have to have in order to sell on Amazon is inventory, whether it be in a warehouse somewhere or in a fulfillment center. If you don't have that, it doesn't matter how good your strength, ranking strategy is, doesn't matter how good uh, your your cash flow is, it doesn't matter how good your PPC strategy or influencer marketing strategy is, you don't have anything to sell and you don't have the product there, you simply just cannot sell it and you're going to suffer for it. So the more control over that ecosystem that you can bring in, whether whatever that looks like for your brand, it's imperative that you, you get that on lock, whether sourcing from more local you know, countries or um, supply chains, or even, um, you know, having a, a B, C, D, E, F, and G uh, solution and backup plan. So those are things that we're constantly telling sellers and, and see failing ones, but also successful ones. They have those in place in case something happens. Yeah, I want, I want to piggyback on what Ryan's saying and just iterate how important it is. One of the main reasons I see people fail or products fail is not because they chose the wrong product necessarily, but because they didn't order enough inventory. And you start mashing in some of the outside traffic strategies, which can boost sales, influencer marketing, you can see a massive spike in sales. When you run out of stock on Amazon, the algorithm will start to accumulate negative history because you're not making any sales. There's no clicks, there's no add to carts, there's nothing. And so that's, that's going to be averaged in. So if you're out of stock for a significant amount of time, 30, 45, 60 days to get that back can be very difficult. And so constantly running out of stock is 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 a great way to to ruin your business and to to kill your your momentum um so everything ryan is saying getting more efficient properly planning inventory and making sure that well to order enough inventory yeah it's always heartbreaking to see a new seller launch a product and it just like takes off in sales. They see the potential. They're like, yes, this is going great. And then stock out. And then it's just such a struggle to like bring it back to where it was. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, one of the, the tips I would tell people today, make sure that your marketing and sales team are talking to each other constantly. When are my promotions going? This is where I'm influencer marketing. This is when these campaigns and promotions are going to hit. Is that going to align well with our inventory strategy? If it's not, then we need to not run that the, those strategies. So it's a constant communication that not a lot of businesses are actually taking issue up with, and they're they're getting they're suffering the consequences due to it. Of hey, I can pay ten thousand dollars for a, a nice little post with an Instagram or TikTok influencer. Sales are going great. Then all of a sudden, you have your logistics team scrambling around saying we need you know another thousand units as soon as possible into a fulfillment center. Just not going to happen. And uh, marketing team did their job. Logistics team is now kind of playing catch up and it's going to be, you know, back and forth. And it goes the other way too. If you're not on the same page with your logistics strategy, you're going to have inventory that sits. It's not going to be uh, applicable possibly if you're a seasonal uh, seller, all these things matter. So it's the constant communication and making sure that calendars align.
What about you, Tyler? Yeah, the one thing that I try to, every brand I talk to, I try to talk about this is Amazon storefronts. You know, there's a pretty big push this last year. It seems like where Amazon was saying, hey, be more brand focused. Like they came out with the brand referral bonus program, <laughs> like branded, right? And I think it's really cool with Amazon storefronts is I look at a lot of them and a lot of them are lifestyle images. A lot of them are like pretty pictures and whatnot but you can make them transactional. You can send traffic there and people can buy straight from your Amazon storefront, an area, the only area on Amazon where competition isn't everywhere, right? And if you can get traffic there, if you can build those pages out to be transactional, it's something that I think is gonna be a huge, huge thing uh, and benefit value add and competitive advantage for a lot of brands. <clears throat> um, we actually at Amped, we submitted a case study uh, that actually got us nominated for partner of the year and the case study was about sending traffic to Amazon storefronts, designing them the right way, and then getting people to follow your brand, right? You know, when we think about, you know, how do you build a, how do you build a brand, not just move more products? It all comes with who's following you. And with that little follow button that Amazon's rolled out, I know it's not the most value add right now. They're still working on how you can actually uh, leverage your followers, but there's a lot of cool things that I've heard coming down the pipeline on the Amazon side that if brands can be ahead of the curve on that, have a nice big follower base. So, you know, six months, a year from now, when it's super easy to engage with your followers, makes launching new products easier. It makes reselling those current customers, communicating with them, nurturing them, all like kind of traditional D to C best practices we're starting to see come to the Amazon world. Uh, so definitely recommend everyone transactional Amazon storefronts uh, get ahead of the curve on that. Another great little golden nugget there. Um, big fan of storefronts. I, I've i worked in e-commerce personally for about like five, no, it's been longer than that, longer than five years. Um, and so I've seen storefronts come out and evolve. And exactly like you were saying, Amazon really is leaning into the concept of a brand and community and building those followers. Um, I mean, we talked about social commerce, the importance of TikTok, the people are there. And I would say one other thing that everyone touched on a little bit are different data points. We've talked about attribution. We have talked about tracking, inventory, stock levels. There's so much data available that you need to keep an eye on. So what are your recommended best practices for looking at this data? We obviously have some ad experts. We have some inventory experts. So everyone has a different perspective on what they're looking at what about i will start with you brandon yeah for us it's uh understanding the potential in the market uh so this goes back to um us understanding what keywords are driving sales for a specific type of product which ones are achievable i think that um, a lot of people will look at um you know the the what the one or two or three best sellers in a niche are are achieving as far as sales, and not really back out and and not to plug data dive here, but this is the visibility level of visibility you get where you get a list of all the keywords that are actually driving sales for product, but that's so important because it can let you know what you can achieve realistically from a keyword ranks perspective um, and a velocity perspective. So if I know that I can in the first 15 days rank for 60 to 70% of that search volume. And I see several competitors that are in that range, that 60 to 70% range and a rank that's achievable, then I kind of know my velocity, right? And if I know my, my estimated velocity, then I know I can, how many to order and, and how many units to make sure I don't stock out. And then I can add a buffer in there for any additional campaigns I want to do if I want to push harder. But the mistake I think a lot of people make is uh, they won't they won't back out the keywords that aren't realistic, right? Like you're not going to launch a brand new toy and start ranking for toys for three year old girls, right? You know it, that's reserved for the best seller in each of those sub niches, and that's why the whole page is different. It's uh, you very rarely find more than two or three of the same type of toy on a generic keyword like that because they have to have a solid foundation of, of relevant keywords, highly relevant keywords that they are performing well on. And then that pushes them up the ranks on those other generic keywords. So understanding how 
data works, keywords work, how, how to look at, at uh, competitors and get a realistic idea of the upside of a niche. It's the foundation of everything that you have to do on Amazon. It's, uh, there's so much more to it than that, but start there. Uh, and, and then you can see of, of how hard you should be pushing, what the upside is, what keywords you want to try to get into next, what root words. And um, you know, these outside campaigns are worth even running. Um, and then manage your cash flow and your inventory the same way we we're talking about earlier. So we've talked foundation. So now let's talk inventory and logistics. Ryan, how do you keep track of your inventory? Are you forecasting? Where where should someone start? Yeah, I would say um, I would say I think it's an imperative that a lot of people double check their their numbers constantly. So. Uh, being in software, I think it's always a, a safety rule to say, don't rely on one data set, make sure you're, uh, you're constantly cross-checking. Um, that might be wrong uh, from data, uh, Brandon's perspective. I don't know. Uh, I, I think that a lot of people are no, it just needs constantly... to, it needs, You're absolutely right, man. Yeah. Like it needs to constantly be updated, right? Like refresh it, look for new keywords, new ways people are calling things. One of the biggest things with keywords sometimes is the autofill. When you start yeah. typing in a keyword into Amazon and they give you a suggestion, that changes sometimes. So a keyword can go from like three or five or 8,000 uh, searches a month to 300. And another one went from 300 to 8,000, right? Absolutely. So yeah, absolutely. Always be updating it. Yeah. That was a, and, and that's something that, you know, again, people say, follow, follow data, follow, follow constantly what the numbers are telling you. Don't do it on feel. Um, there was a cool, actually free tool that Amazon released as of even late October, early November. It's called the product opportunity finder and uh, explorer, excuse me. And um, it's something where not just here in the United States, you can look for opportunity, but as a global um, as a global lens, you can actually see that same keyword and search for them. I did a, a live case study with, um, with some sellers over at Carbon6. And, uh, and recently I was saying, hey, what's your top keyword? Let, let's just test out this tool. And his top uh, uh, phrase was uh, camping blanket, which again is, is something that is pretty generic. But even searching for that in the in a market like a, a Germany or even the UK, where it's not a foreign translation, it's not a not an outside the box a phrase. There's zero searches for that keyword, and that's zero. In here in the United States, it's in the tens of thousands of searches. So again, localization in terms of data points where you're searching for is constantly changing. It just depends on more of where the customer is coming from and what they're used to calling things. Right? Um, it's just the it's just the language of the world. It's going to be constantly evolving. So you have to con you have to know what people are searching for. Is it different languages within that marketplace? Is it different um, phrases in those in those points? So th that's that's one thing that uh, we tell people to constantly update and, and look at those tools that are free or just cross and validate with each other. Um, the second is just obviously um, you know making sure that your numbers are are checking out with sales velocity of what you're currently selling, but also what Amazon's telling you projection wise or actual sales wise. So just making sure that you're validating in those ecosystems. And if I'm doing X in one market and Y in another, making sure that makes sense to uh, whether it be an opportunity to expand into a market, or uh, maybe I should open up a different iteration of that product in this market. Maybe um, one you know, child product is doing better in a different country than this other. So constantly validate what's being sold in different places and then and then um, look at your own internal data and make those smart choices as well for uh, down the road decisions for your product. Localization is a huge thing. Um, I was on a webinar a few years ago where we came across a product and it was, you know, children's biscuit puzzle. And, you know, in the US biscuit, I don't, I don't need a puzzle of circles, it's a biscuit, but it was a company that had originated the listing in the UK where cookies are biscuits. So in the US, no, you're not, we're, no one's searching for a biscuit puzzle expecting cookies. So, I mean, that ties into everything that you're saying regarding keywords, localization, advertising. We'll need to adjust what works here isn't gonna work internationally or you can't count that it's gonna work internationally. So how does this, come into play when you're driving people from Google? How do you know where to start, Tyler? 
Yeah, you know, localization is such an interesting thing and in how people search in different markets. Uh, it depends on obviously in the market, obviously. Uh, we see pretty similar things, obviously, with Canada and US, but very different things with Europe. Uh, right now, we mostly just do North America and Europe because that's where Amazon attribution is available. That's what we build off of. So those are our two areas of expertise. But it's what we always look at and what we recommend is using the tools available. We have it in our system. You can go outside the system. There's tools like SEMrush and others that give you search volume on how people are searching for your products. Uh, but we always teach our brands is with Google, it's not as much about search volume as it is on Amazon or as it could be on like TikTok or other areas where you're trying to drive a ton of traffic. On Google, you want to be a very long tail, very product specific because of how people search the platforms. Uh, and this is like the biggest thing we have to teach our brands is Amazon ads is so directional. What happens is pretty consistently, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Brandon or any other Amazon seller that wants to raise their hand, but you have really low click through rates and really high conversion rates on Amazon because when people search, they can kind of qualify, look at the pictures, go find the one they want. So the click through rates lower, but then they are pretty sold by the time they click on it. Hopefully often for you guys. Yeah, it, it depends on the niche, I suppose, right? Like, sure. uh, and, and the, and the diversity and the design, whether it's a design oriented product. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Whereas on Google though, you know, there's not a lot of those pictures around it. So like the example I always give is like gift ideas. You could probably get away with something like that on Amazon ads, men's gift ideas, drinking gift ideas, drinking games, those kind of things. If you do that on Google, like there might be a ton of volume but you're getting a ton of research-based things. So all of a sudden that traffic coming in is not super qualified. That traffic's going to bounce. That traffic might not buy anything from Amazon. Therefore, you're not going to get that rank impact or direct sales. So with Google, don't think about it too much in terms of the volume. Think about it as, are people looking specifically for my products? And you can use tools that can help you kind of give you guidance on how often people are searching in different ways on, on Google. <clears throat> what about you, Alex, working with influencers? You mentioned that it isn't necessarily, you know, a one-to-one. -one. It might not be as er as easy to watch that attribution. How do you tell your brands to look at the success of campaigns and data? And you're muted, you're Alex. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, right now, we've got a variety of tools um, in Perpetua. So we do use Amazon attribution links um, to drive traffic back to Amazon. Um, but kind of iffy in terms of uh, how much is actually tracked through those links from my perspective. Um, and then, uh, but we are able to track like all sorts of the data, all sorts of data from TikTok and Instagram. So anything that happens in that platform, we bring into Perpetua. Um, and then we also have a bunch of other um, Amazon stats to measure alongside it. So things like uh, your share of voice on specific keywords, your organic rank, uh, branded searches, all that sort of stuff. So we try to look at things really holistically. Um, going into 2023, I'm really excited about this area because I feel like it is um, huge opportunity, like the ability to like really hone in on attributed sales off of Amazon. Um, and I think there's a lot of uh, cool areas that Amazon's working on, such as AMC, like Amazon Marketing Cloud, in kind of solving that. So that's where my eyes are going to be for the next year. And I'm, I'm really excited for it. That's good. I love that we're already looking ahead. You're just feeding me our follow-up <laughs> questions. Um, we have one more before we get to that one, though. So we all, we all know the state of the economy right now. Everyone everywhere is looking for efficiencies, cost saving. Um, we've talked a little bit about it. Look at your numbers, see what your numbers are telling you. You know, a quarter on one product ends up being a heck of a lot more the more that you sell. So where would you recommend a brand start if they're like, we need to cut costs, let's look at our inventory, let's look at our advertising. Where should someone start? We'll start with you, Alex. Um, I'll 
look at it from the lens of influencer marketing specifically. Um, I think there's a few schools of thought when tackling influencer marketing. Um, one is to pay the big bucks for huge creators. Um, and the other is to utilize um, micro-influencers. And from my perspective, I think the large creators work really well in an environment where you're trying to build um, brand image, reputability, things like that, and actually work with someone who, who their followers are like actually influenced by what that person says, right? Um, versus the micro creators where their followers might not really like care as much or might not be as loyal. Um, I think that strategy actually works much better in an environment where you're trying to be efficient. And the reason is, as I spoke to earlier, you can take that piece of content, which you paid very little for, and then you can boost it with Spark ads. So like Spark ads, we're seeing like, uh, I think our average right now is like a $5 CPM and like CPCs are like, we had one recently, a campaign that was four cent CPC driving like relevant traffic to Amazon. So they're not all like that, but that was, that was an outlier. Um, but I think that strategy is very efficient. So pay a little bit for your, your content and then just scale it big with, with Spark. That's such a big one, you know, for brands, if they're looking at events or scaling, influencer marketing, whatever, sometimes it is looking at the broader lens that yes, that influencer might not have driven the traffic that we were looking for on that campaign, but we have this user-generated content that will help us achieve more. And so it isn't necessarily that one-to-one, -one, it can't be more. Yeah, exactly. And that UGC can also be used anywhere. So mm -hmm. you want to use that on the other social platforms. Mm -hmm. You even had brands turn them into sponsor brands videos that end up looking really cool. Um, you can throw it on your DTC as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, definitely a lot of benefit there. What about you, Ryan? Um, I guess cutting costs. I mean, obviously there, there's the whole adage of get rid of your non-selling products. Um, you just have to constantly evaluate what's at the end of its life. Um, I, I do this evaluation all the time and I'm constantly asking people who are buying, you know, top selling products or they're trending products, you know, how long is, how long are you expecting this product to be of relevant relevancy uh, to the market? Is it three years? Is it five years? And, and just constantly evaluate, you know, that performing product and what that's going to look like for you before you have to inevitably either kill it or start from scratch or add on to it. Um, but I think what Amazon is rewarding more for cost savings is they don't want your inventory sitting in their warehouses uh, for a long period of time. And it's just, uh, they're going to keep jacking up those rates in terms of storage fees, your IPI score, just how much you can even send in at one time. They don't want to be a storage facility for, for brands. So looking at capabilities of either working with you know, a, a logistics partner that can get your goods into, you know, a warehouse more often um, that can be done with small parcel or doing um, pallets at a time more frequently instead of, hey, here's my container. I have to schedule my truckload to get in there um, three weeks out. That, that's just not a efficient model that Amazon's rewarding now anymore. Um, they they want to see that frequency, that establishment uh, to be more frequent into their, their uh, fulfillment center. So, to constantly evaluate that ecosystem and and know how often you can get goods into there, whether it be having something nearby a fulfillment center, or um, you know working with a partner. I mean that that's where we're seeing a lot of people try to figure out how I can get more goods into fulfillment centers more often and just uh, be rewarded in that regards instead of eating the storage fee costs. Um, other way, other things are, um, you know the payment terms on, on their inventory, right? Of, Hey, can I, can I negotiate once I sell through a certain amount or if I ship a certain amount, can you store those, that those pieces for me in uh, your warehouse until I need them and, and can pay for them in those capacities. So negotiating constantly with people to know that they, they can maybe hold on to inventory so that it's either 
they're ready for you to use or to just work on payment terms uh, for you. So you have cash flow in order to pay for big bulk orders. You know, the more you're ordering, the more of a discount you're going to achieve for more often than not uh, your product. So it's it's worthwhile to explore those times right now. Um, because obviously with Chinese New Year, if you have a Chinese manufacturer right now, um, you start to see the churnover in employees um, at factories. You start to, there's that downtime where they're starting their own uh, fiscal new year. So there's actually, um, there's going to be those natural bumps in costs. So you can negotiate those rates right now um, while, you know, before there's um, their new year. So it, you just have to look at seasonality and who your supply chain is, but also where there might be just like dead weight and just cut that off. Obviously, it's bad to to think that you have to get rid of employees. That's the last thing anyone wants to do. Um, but if you can kind of streamline those ecosystems um, more so, that that's going to be more efficient and more of a an immediate impact than you know cutting jobs or cutting costs. But again, I'm not one to those. Those are the the best case scenarios where you can start to see improvements. Of course, uh, we had um, Vanessa Hung on a webinar earlier this year, and one of her, we asked a similar question, when, and she shared a story of working with a client that it went so far as to how they were packing a pallet, because they were wasting space, and so in the end, you know, it was costing them a hundred pallet shipments in, whereas repacking it was only you know 65 pallet shipments and so i mean you can go back to the very beginning and find efficiencies there yeah what's what's interesting i'll, I'll add to that exact thing that you're saying um and this is a shout out for my friends and in end game uh which is the software sometimes it's counterintuitive exactly what you're saying sometimes it, like some people try to fit as many as they can in a case to optimize per case but optimizing for pallet is more important uh, because that that's more like the units you can get into a container are roughly the same, but what you can get on a pallet will matter for the logistics at the warehousing and everything. Mm -hmm. And they help you uh, model that just by putting the dimensions in. It's pretty neat. And how to, how to actually pack it into the carton, right? I love efficiencies like that. It's like a game of Tetris, but that saves you money. It's the best thing. <laughs> um, what about you, Tyler, and talking ads? Yeah, uh, I, I can talk to the ads part too, but kind of flipping the question too, you know, I think it's natural instinct to think about cutting costs, but at the same time, I think a lot of brands are looking to grow and to grow, you need to spend, right? So thinking through the lens of maybe less cost cuttings, but more of, hey, what are the right investments? What are the biggest impactful investments? You know, looking back at 2022, um, aggregators kind of took a hit, right? Like they were super frothy, like super investments, but kind of just spraying money around. And, you know, in hindsight, the ones that are successful are like super, super smart and um uh, impactful and thoughtful about how, where they're investing, not just throwing money around because they had the money to spend. So encouraging brands and sellers to think about that, right? As you look for 2023, you know, cut the fat, absolutely, if there's areas that you can, but where can you be the most impactful with potentially the, the limited money that you have to invest? Because you want to grow in 2023 and you're going to need to invest in the right areas to have the biggest impact. As far as Google ads, it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's knowing what campaigns are your most efficient, and most impactful, and then what keywords specifically are driving the biggest impact for your business. And looking at the data and valuing the data, we see it all the time, unfortunately, uh, with our brands where they'll turn on campaigns, they won't touch it for a while, then they'll come back and you know some keywords are doing really well, some are not, and some campaigns are doing real, really well and some are not. Take it seriously, right? Like be, be in the weeds, really get your hands dirty, um, with you doing a new channel, whether it's Google, whether it's TikTok or an influencer, you need to learn it. You need to spend that time up front to learn it or partner with an agency that knows it and knows what to do. Uh, we, we're pretty intentional with the agencies that we partner with, a lot of AMP certified agencies out there and more each week. So engage with a professional because it's it can be a really smart investment for you, but it's not a silver bullet. It's not a hack. It's a long-term strategy. And uh, specifically, Google needs to be implemented the right way. 
Yeah. Above. So, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. You got Sorry. it, Brandon. You got it. No, Tyler stole my answer. I think that when people are fearful, I think Buffett has something about when people are fearful, then it's a good time to invest, right? Um, yep. Everyone's everyone's looking at this time uh, where uh, everyone feels like you should be retracting and worried and everything. I think it's about to get bad with real estate. I think it's about to get bad with retail. Spending is down. Um, there's a lot of there are a lot of indicators out there that show us that we're just at the precipice of a major recession. But last time we were in a major recession, e-commerce continued to grow. Um, retailers, those with large overhead, um, you know, those are the ones that suffered the most. And as those businesses fold or retract or uh, go, the demand for a lot of products will, you know, although going down, they still need to find them. And e-commerce and, and the conditioning to shop online has only gotten better. Now, I wouldn't get into gr try to grow my luxury goods brand or my travel brand right now, right? But what I would say is that um, I'm looking for an opportunity to more than double my Amazon business next year, despite a recession happening. Uh, and you have to start with, again, with that foundation of solid uh, data and then move into the solid foundation of uh, proper processes and systems to be efficient with shipping, logistic, storage, um, and knowing your numbers, launches, and rely and, and knowing how to rank products organically so you can take advantage of them. But now is the time to be probably pushing harder versus uh, pulling back when, you know, again, just being um, counter, uh, what, what is the word I'm looking for? contrarian to to the feelings of others is going to be a, a big opportunity in my mind. I think that's great. And that ties in. We're just about at the top of the hour. Um, so we will wrap it up. And I have one final question that I think everyone has touched on just a little bit. But going into 2023, what is one piece of advice or one thing that you are most looking forward to in the world of e-commerce? We will start with Ryan. Yeah, have to start this off. Um, let's think. I, I think kind of putting this all in perspective, I think knowing a timeline, like having yourself timelines and that roadmap of what you're doing, we call it today like a playbook. Um, you have to know how long things take to implement. Like Brandon said, we're planning for Q4 probably in a month or two for 2023. Those are, those are time frames that you you can't fudge and you you can't be you can't cheap out on um it's going to cost you money it's going to it's going to you know tank your business if you try to escalate those even quicker than what they should so making sure that you spend the due diligence the time the effort of what 2023 looks like whether how many products this is how many I'm going to launch next year this is how many how much money I have to invest in ads or into influencer marketing or in uh, Google ads uh, or entering a new market. Just knowing how long it takes to get into those those weeds of it and to have that be fruitful for you is going to be in super important. For example, our our model at our business is always education, how long I can get up and running in Canada versus Singapore versus Japan versus any of these other based upon my category. And that answer is always, it depends. Um, it depends on what you're selling as a brand. It depends on um, how much you're, you're sending from where to when, um, how you wanted to get there. It just depends. So getting all those answers and start planning your roadmap is super important. And so that, that's what we're constantly teaching people of, if you're looking for growth outside of just one marketplace, whether it be outside of Amazon, in Amazon, which is probably the easiest one you could do, just know how long it takes um, and so that, that's kind of our mission for next year is education and how, how you can kind of set yourself up for success, you know, not just tomorrow, but also months and years from now. What about you, Tyler? Yeah, this is kind of a, I'm kind of punching the question here a little bit, but it's kind of the unknown uh, from Amazon. What's, what's Amazon going to do? You know, it's interesting to see how, you know, brands are competing with each other on Amazon, of course, but higher up level, Amazon's competing with Shopify, with Walmart, which is, I think, good for brands and sellers because, you know, the incentives are there as they're trying to, Amazon's trying to get you guys to do more business on Amazon. 
you know, the brand referral bonus that they launched towards the end, I guess, midway through 2021, 10% kickback for external traffic going to Amazon was a direct shot across the bow of Shopify and, you know, other company, other, you know, website hosters like that. So I think that is going to continue to up the ante and continue to try to do things to compete with those other uh, marketplaces or direct to consumer websites. And I think it's going to be beneficial for the brands. Uh, it's competition is usually always good in that regard, but I'm excited to see what they do. We don't know what they're going to do. Amazon's pretty quite tight lipped on some of that stuff, but some of the rumors that I've been kind of hearing uh, with our partnership with them is good indicators that that ante is going to continue to be upped and whatever they end up rolling out, hopefully it's beneficial to brands and uh, allows you to be more profitable and uh, continue growing your brands. What about you, Alex? You alluded to what you're looking forward to. Yes. Um, first of all, actually uh, talk on Tyler's point a little bit um, because I also think that this year has been really big for other avenues um, like retail media. Um, I've been into the like Criteo and Citrus world uh, a little bit in my past. So um, basically how all of these other retailers are activating their ad platforms is really interesting. It seems like they're coming online and they're starting to level up. They're still like more than three years behind Amazon, um, <laughs> maybe five, uh, but um, more competition. And then especially the, the world that I'm in now, um, TikTok has TikTok shop. So they've started to already kind of like battle with Amazon of like, you know, can we get sellers to create product listings within TikTok? Can we get users to complete the checkout all through within TikTok, you know? Um, so I'm curious. I think it'll be a hard battle from TikTok's perspective, to be honest. I don't think they're going to be able to just like create a like e-commerce behemoth um, out of thin air. Um, I think Instagram has struggled a little bit with Instagram shopping, um, but who knows? They have a lot of users, so potentially. Um, and then, uh, yeah, like what I, what I alluded to earlier is just um, attribution. Uh, I really think 2021 was very rough from an attribution perspective with iOS 14. Um, I'm hoping, uh, or 2022, sorry. Um, I'm hoping that with 2023, Amazon uh, rolls out AMC a little bit more, starts to integrate it um, a little bit better with Amazon Seismic and a few other things. And yeah, I think it's going to be pretty huge. I would recommend if anyone is like not fully in the loop on AMC and you're like a mid to large seller, definitely like start educating yourself because it's it seems like a very powerful tool. It's a great piece of advice. All right, Brandon, close us out. Yeah, I think I, like, I'm super bullish on e-commerce in general, like I was saying mm -hmm. earlier. And I think that what has me most excited, Tyler alluded to it, and uh, but, but I think Amazon is going to continue to give us more data. It's like what Alex was still talking to a little bit. We've noticed that the PPC team at Amazon is always thinking API first, so mm -hmm. pushing more data. And the business team and the business analytics team, the one that most sellers are familiar with and want more from, generally is very black box and guarded around like what's happening. But we've noticed that they're starting to shift and provide more and more uh, data on keyword keyword research, uh, the uh, the product the product discovery tool that they put mm -hmm. out, the niche you know the niche uh, discovery, some of their conversion rates and click through rates and search volumes are starting to be a little bit more accessible. I'm excited that they're going to give us more and more of that data because we want to just have the best and, and most accurate data so we can make the best decisions and utilize that to rank and to do things. But um, I think other marketplaces are going to be a massive place of growth in 2023. And if you have any retraction on Amazon in your niche, you can easily make that up by going into Walmart and, and concentrating on an influencer strategy and having a, a like a D2C presence potentially. Um, Walmart's fulfillment services, which is the FBA competitor, 
That's mm -hmm. the missing link that they were missing all these years, right? Um, no one was interested in trying to figure out a whole new supply chain with heavy overhead uh, around fulfillment, individual fulfillment of packages when FBA let us leverage their billion dollar infrastructure to do that for us, right? Completely different business model, a lot more cost intensive and just wasn't attractive enough. And now that they've got a fulfillment center, I can tell you that the traffic on Walmart is there to make them a major player in the space. And I think that they make major strides into market share next year. I also heavily agree with Alex. So uh, that TikTok has the opportunity based on what the parent company has done in China, has the opportunity to become the number three player in the space very quickly. Uh, that can be a market that they do the checkout directly. Now, again, this is a fulfillment issue uh, that will probably be hindering the ability to grow. But if you're if you're pointing them somewhere where you have the inventory being handled for you, one of these other fulfillment centers, Amazon or Walmart, then you can use TikTok to potentially outsell even on Walmart or Amazon. Um, the, the opportunity is there. There are people that go live in China for 12 hours at a time and do a hundred or more million dollars in U US dollars in one day. That's a real number. That's what real big influencers can do. Now it's a bigger market and they're much more accustomed to shopping live, but I think we're moving in that direction. And as retailers continue to struggle and the recession closes doors because people were barely holding on, people are gonna look for entertainment, experiential shopping, live, gravitating towards uh, people that have uh, like influence that are fun to watch, uh, that's going to be. Now, even if they're, they're tightening up their budgets, they're still gonna need to buy certain things and they're not gonna give away most things. Like there's a hierarchy of things they give away and women are not gonna give away makeup. They're, they're gonna continue to put makeup on no matter how much the bills you know uh, get tight, right? So there are certain uh, markets that are going to continue to grow next year. And there's all of this opportunity from a data perspective and from multiple channels perspective that, that have me very excited. So again, I'm super bullish on, on anything e-commerce next year. Everyone's scared. When they're scared, it's time to go. Let's go. I can't imagine that we could end on a better note than that. So I do want to take the time to thank all of you gentlemen for being here with me today and sharing your thoughts on 2023. There was so much information packed into this webinar and it's so valuable to our community. So again, thank you, Alex, Tyler, Ryan, and Brandon. Um, and if you have any questions for us, feel free to reach out to all of our companies. Everyone here is available. Find us on LinkedIn, whatever you need. We're so excited for 2023 and have a great day, everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us.